Can infrastructure as code apply to bare metal? Yes, of course it can. Let's infrastructure as code some bare metal. Hello, I am Rob Hirschfeld, your host for this session of the LISA 2021 conference. I am the CEO and co-founder of RackN, and we have years and years of experience of running infrastructure as code on bare metal with digital rebar. And of course, it's not just bare metal, but let's talk about bare metal because it's hard and important. This talk is a sequel to my 2020 SRECon Pixie Talk, where I talk about all of the different ways that we actually boot and install operating systems. And we go into some very deep content in that talk, and I highly recommend you checking it out. We have a intro and an advanced section in on YouTube, uh, and you can dive in and see exactly how these things go uh, down in the weeds and uh, really understand it. It's, it's an important technology to understand if you're dealing with bare metal. But we're going to work a layer above that, really talking about how we build automation that is durable and performant. And to do that, we want to talk about infrastructure as code. The, the thing about infrastructure as code is that everybody see something different in it. And I, I explore this in another topic uh, called Aspiring to Infrastructure as Code, where I decompose infrastructure of code into six key areas, starting with things like using source code, having immutability, uh, being aware of current state, seeking desired state, collaboration and reuse, and then using an infrastructure pipeline. I'm going to dive into those so that we have some base. Uh, but first, we need to talk about what's new in infrastructure as code. And why we don't just call this DevOps or SRE or Runbook Automation. Uh, you know, the challenge here is infrastructure as code is not a job or a product category. It's really an infrastructure automation approach. And that's a powerful thing to understand. Uh, very much like how DevOps is a union between developers and operators, it's really about taking operational work infrastructure and making it more operations uh, developer-like. Uh, what I often think of is saying the CIO pounding on the desk and says, why can't my ops team be more like my development team? That's what infrastructure as code is about, and it's a good practice. Speaking of your boss, in listening to this talk, I hope to inspire you with great ideas and things that you want to go out and do, and that's important. But none of it's going to work if you can't sell infrastructure as code as your boss. Now, good news is your boss is probably reading about it on the airline magazines. And now that they're flying again, getting all excited about it from a glossy brochure. And it is cool technology and it does save time and effort and money. But if you want to talk to business people about infrastructure as code, the language here is about risk reduction. Infrastructure as code creates more transparent and audible systems, so they are more compliant and they reduce your compliance risk. They are more repeatable, so they reduce your delivery risk, meaning that you can deliver systems, code, and infrastructure more confidently. And critically, they are more collaborative. They reduce the bus factor of your organization and reduce your people risk because everything you do can be translated and repeated for multiple people. At the end of the day, I really believe that infrastructure as code is a collaboration story more than any other technology component. Um, and that's an important part of that. Fortunately, collaboration is often the hardest to sell um, in an organization. And that means that we need to be able to talk concretely about other types of benefits. But no matter what you do, you're going to need money, time, and political capital to implement an infrastructure as code strategy. So I wish you good luck on that. And hopefully we'll give you some tips that will help you in that journey. But this isn't just about infrastructure as code in general. This is about infrastructure as code on bare metal. And bare metal is harder. Uh, that doesn't mean we don't want it to be the same as cloud or as powerful as cloud. And even if cloud has better APIs, the challenges that we're dealing with here as infrastructure as code will translate. Uh, they come down from cloud, and the things that we're going to talk about actually go up to cloud and virtual infrastructure, too. So why is this harder? This is going to play throughout every other problem that we have to talk about. Um, you can't use APIs to recable a box. You have to take things as they come. So bare metal is what is you get what you get. You don't throw a fit, as we say in my household. Um, the other thing that's important is there's necessary complexity. Abstractions are not always helpful, especially in bare metal, where you actually have to know the enumeration of drives or which NIC is cabled to which port. And that complexity 
is something that you have to cope with. You want to remove complexity where you can, but if you oversimplify things, you actually make your job a lot harder. And we see that when people build APIs that just reduce everything to one command or a simple, here's a box, here's an OS. Um, bare metal is going to require more. And there are a lot of APIs. The nice thing about cloud is even if it's different services in the cloud, it's really one API. Um, in physical infrastructure, you have to juggle the APIs, DHCP, TFTP, HTTP. Check out that Pixie booting talk. There are t at least five, often 10 uh, services, interfaces, APIs that you need to deal with to make a system fully functional in a bare metal environment. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's the reality of having to juggle all these services. If you're not doing it, you're talking to a service that does do it for you, um, like Digital Rebar. And that's fine. That's, you know, figure out the right level of abstraction for you, but that's what makes bare metal hard. And then finally, and most critically, is what I call the peanut butter and chocolate thing. Provisioning and configuration are often considered very different things, but they need to be done together. You have to work in, outside of a system and inside of a system. Provisioning is on the outside where you're building the infrastructure and the resources and configuration is inside. We're actually talking to the OS and configuring your security and credentials and drive partitions and network mapping and VLANs and installing applications. Both have to be done in concert. And that is one of the places where we've built beautiful tools for each thing and haven't thought much about the integration, the pipelines that actually need to get built to make this work together. So let's break down our infrastructure as code thinking. The first thing to think about here is automation and source code. And this one seems really obvious, but let's go deeper than just, yeah, I stuffed my, my automation code into Git. The idea here is that your operations tools should expect and really demand that you're using Git and source code controls as part of your operational techniques. Things should be versioned, they should be stored in Git, they should be able to be extracted and tagged. Um, all of those concepts need to be in your, source, your automation system, and it should understand that. And that includes, for bare metal, things like doing your kickstarts, your precedes, your weasel, um, cloud init, you know, all of those pieces. Now, and always, never store credentials in those files. You need to have your automation in a way that you can inject your secrets as you go. Always a challenge. Immutability is absolutely critical, right? Less touch, more love is the way I like to think about this. And the beauty of immutability when you get it right, so think about deploying an image instead of building an image from configuration, is that it makes it very fast and easy to recreate instances. And that's the idea with immutability. You can stamp out and repeat your success much, much faster. You replace instead of patch or change. That means image-based deployment's a really important tech. Um, we've been doing this for a long time in, in the digital rebar space, and it is a better, faster way to go. It takes a little bit more work up front. Um, Post config is okay, right? Keep it minimal, replace, don't patch. And for bare metal, treat bare metal as much as you can like cloud. That means reset, repave, not patch. That includes run a process that includes your firmware updates and changes as part of your, your sessions. So always look at the system as a reset, very cloud-like, rather than a system that's gonna run for 10 years and have to be incrementally patched. Moving to that type of thinking, that immutability thinking, is an important part of being successful in infrastructure as code. Current state is a critical component here. Uh, this is what we often call the reconciler pattern. Um, but the challenge with current state is that you have to think through that there isn't going to be any one source of truth. If something is, ha is designed to be a source of truth, it is not going to be trustworthy. In infrastructure especially, things change outside of any one tool's control, and the resilience of your whole system depends on every tool being able to recognize that fact and work with other tools to determine truth. So you have to be able to track your state um, throughout the system. All parts of your pipeline should be able to expect handoffs between other things, expect that drift, um, and this is critical Automation should stop. 
Automation that keeps trying to be successful, even when the thing when things don't match the patterns it's expecting, will cause more harm, especially in physical systems. And so it's very important that automation stops when state doesn't match. For bare metal, uh, this is a very much true. Check, verify, act, and confirm. You know, uh, one of the things that we've built into a lot of the workflows that we build as standard templates, what we call a universal uh, template, and I'll demo if I have time here, is that we check, verify and confirm as much as possible. Uh, the time it takes to do that is minimal compared to the benefits that you get from preventing accidental configurations or mistakes. And that, uh, mistakes are very, very expensive. Desired state here, what some people I, I believe are calling GitOps, not my favorite term, but I understand the, the value here, is that you can be more declarative, less imperative in how you make things go. And that is a benefit. You want to be able to say, I want my systems to end up as this state, as this configuration at, with these, uh, this information installed. And rather than dictating step, 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 if you are writing automation in which you have to drive each step through the system instead of stating the end goal, then you are doing a lot of extra work. And that driving is fragile. And you need to think of ways and look at tools that help you be more declarative. This is part of the reason why people get very excited about Kubernetes, because it is very declarative. This is the system I want you to build. Go build that system. Uh, there are transparency challenges in these and if you look at a declarative system, make sure that you can actually easily understand the steps it's taking as it drives to that end goal. So you should think through, how do I make sure that my end goal description is understandable? Be aware that when something breaks during that declarative operation, I can see what's happening. Uh, broken tool handoffs are a big source of, of challenge here. And that single source of truth methodology I mentioned before is a super tricky thing to manage in desired state systems. And for bare metal, you know, the thing that makes automation really hard in bare metal systems is that they often have to reboot multiple times to achieve that desired state. And so when you are thinking about the automation you're building or the automation you're consuming, remember that it has to actually walk through multiple reboots. And that has to be normal. Uh, for what we do, we often see systems going from one operating system to another operating system to a third operating system um, or changing context between how they talk to that operating system. And being able to do that work transforms how you build a workflow because the workflows are able to then work across a completely different state change for the systems. And that brings us to the infrastructure pipeline concepts that no operation in your infrastructure ever ha happens in isolation. There is no single server action. Everything involves multiple steps and things that work together. But even more importantly, you start from a state that you want to get to and you need to get to a final state. And that involves configuration, provisioning, DNS entries, certificates, security, getting secrets unlocked, uh, handing off information to other systems. They all have to work together which means that silos have to have APIs that enable that. Uh, there are tools like DNS that you just have to be able to talk to. You're not expecting your DNS system to also become your provisioning system, and that's okay. You do have to be aware that systems that rely exclusively on their own state are going to cause challenges in your pipeline because things will happen outside of those tools. And you want to bias towards event-based and observable systems. The nice thing about event-based systems is that they will tell you when things change. So you can subscribe to updates, listen for those updates. You don't have to be constantly polling or then figuring out if you missed some drift. And that's really an important thing to think about for building a, a productive, effective pipeline. And for bare metal, uh, this is going to sound funny, but think cloud, right? Use the immutability and repaving topics that we've already covered aggressively. When you do that, you will find that a lot of the pipeline operations are much simpler because instead of trying to figure out how to fix a system, you're just resetting it. And that is actually a much simpler way to think about building infrastructure all together as a single thing. And finally, and most importantly, is that when you're building these systems, build them in a collaborative way. Always build your automation so others can reuse it. You're building automation that only you understand, then it's not actually automating a system. It's just saving you some work. The soul of infrastructure's code is collaboration, and you need to be thinking through 
how do you make this documented, right? If you haven't documented things, shut down this video, go document the work that you're doing, right? You must be doing documentation as close to the automation as possible. Your automation needs to deco decompose into reusable blocks. Um, a lot of automation supports this, but they haven't made it easy enough. Uh, and you want to be using tools that make it very easy to take small pieces of work and reuse them in other places. Ideally, reuse them across the industry. Because if you're using code that everybody else can share, then that code will get sustained and updated and patched and checked. It takes a little bit of extra work, but it really, really helps. And the number one, number one way to make that happen is to make sure that your systems and automation declare their variables. Do not have ad hoc input output. You want to know what the type is. You want to know what the limits are. You want to have those documented. The systems you use should have clearly defined variables. Ideally require those variables or at least be very explicit about what they are and how they're defined. Something that you think is a string and somebody else treats like a Boolean or an int is going to wreak havoc and limit reuse. And there is no better place to start than making sure that the inputs and outputs of all of your automation are clearly defined and tightly controlled. And for bare metal, it, I, I know a ton of people who spend time doing firmware patches or pixie booting things and stuff like that. It's not a place you're adding value. It is hard. It is not consistent across vendors. And you will add some complexity by reusing somebody else's code because they have handled the situations that you are not seeing at the moment. But you will see them. Your hardware will change, your systems will change, and you're not contributing to the greater good. Do not write this yourself. Reuse other people's code for making this happen. It's just not something that helps anybody to do it by themselves. So let's make this work for bare metal. We've talked about infrastructure as code in general senses, but we really want to get into the things that make bare metal challenging, right? The physical control, physical reuse, operations, and infrastructure pipelines. And so we, we really want to talk about this, but they are applying not just to bare metal. Any heterogeneous systems are going to have these same challenges, which would mean multi-cloud, even multi-site infrastructure. So, Physical control specifically. Cloud APIs are beautiful, but the just give me a server cannot be that simple in bare metal. Uh, you really need to understand where it's connected, how it's connected, and there are limits for the cloud and container APIs for infrastructure. So be careful of somebody who says, I'm just going to use my cloud or container APIs to get bare metal infrastructure. Uh, that means they're going to have to expose things in APIs or in metadata that they're not used to exposing and might be much more limited than you think. So be careful with physical control in those systems. Uh, if you have a very homogenous system, maybe you can make it work, but bare metal is not homogenous. Uh, there's a balance of abstractions and APIs needed versus the control that you need. I like to say abstractions are needed until they're not. Um, and an example here is that Java Hibernate um, versus Rails Active Record. In Java Hibernate, they extended the language to handle basically all of the SQL exceptions that you would need. And that made Hibernate incredibly complex, if you've seen that, that language, where Rails Active Record said, we do these simple things well, and that's it. And if you need to do anything more complex, write it in SQL. Basically bypass our abstraction. And that is a good way to think about these things. You know, places where you can use an API, use the API. Places where the API is giving you grief, stop. Uh, we see this with provisioning configuration tools that try to do the opposite thing. They have a lot of challenge changing context. And you know you want to use tools in their sweet spots and then use a different tool when you're out of that sweet spot. The other thing to do is don't get frustrated when there are limitations in what you've got to deal with because it happens. It takes time to solve these things. We build quirk files for servers. We recognize that sometimes there's a bug in how systems work and we have to code around it. Um, and that is the reality of de dealing with bare metal. So yeah, pound on your keyboard for a minute, but then get over it. Build resilient code and, and embrace it. If you try to simplify all of your bare metal challenges down in away, you're actually going to make things harder in the end because the reality is going to come back to, to get you in the end. And that comes into this idea 
of reusing physical infrastructure. Why is it so hard for us to make these things work? Why is it so hard for us to take software and automation that works in one place and, and redo it? Why is it so hard for us to just reset servers? Um, firmware is unfortunately really hard and hardware OEMs, I know y'all work really hard at this. It's still really hard. Redfish is improving things maybe because there's some collaboration, but there's still heterogeneity. Different vendors implement the specs in different ways and you have to deal with it. Uh, it would be really nice if they didn't change their own tooling all the time and be, were more consistent. I, changing the output of a command is really burdensome. So be careful, uh, hardware vendors. I'm, I'm looking at you, really. Uh, dealing with heterogeneity in systems is something you have to deal with. Um, and remember that even if you're only buying from one hardware vendor, there will be variation. They will change their models, they will change their firmware, they will change how they enumerate drives, um, everything. It's normal. It, expect it to happen. If you're hard coding something, it's going to be a problem for you very, very soon. Um, or the person who gets your job after you find that things have gotten too hard and you're looking for greener pastures. Uh, so don't assume homogeneity when you're building systems, assume heterogeneity. Um, and look for systems that embrace and recognize heterogeneity as real. Um, I, to me, one of the most destructive illusions that we have is that you can think you can just pump out everything identically. And that is true in cloud too. I'm looking at you cloud vendors. It's not all the same for them. They're not one API, yay, but things have a lot of variation in cloud. Um, and you have to deal with that there too. And then finally, uh, finding and reusing uh, components. You know, get out of the business of firmware. We talked about this. Reuse, reuse, reuse. Incent the behavior. Uh, you know, if you're if you're leading a team, managing a team, you know, and somebody's writing code for something that they can get, it's going to take them a little bit of time to learn the new thing. But get out of the that pattern of writing something that you could be reusing. That's really important. Reduce, reuse, recycle applies everywhere. Making operations immutable, talked about this several times. It is incredibly important. We have been doing immutable operations for bare metal um, for years now, and the bare metal installs that we do immutably are faster. They're more resilient. They are more secure. It, this is low-hanging fruit. It really, really is. It's going to be different than you're used to if you're used to Pixie Boot and Kickstart and Preseed. But I can promise you, once you got the process working, you will thank me. It is just better. And that leads you back to the other point that's really important. Think in resets, not provisions. What you really want to be doing is looking at this as a cloud-like behavior, uh, in part because that means the cloud tooling that you use will behave correctly on your physical infrastructure. And that will make you scale better. And it might allow you to eliminate virtualization on the bare metal and just treat the bare metal as a machine, because it is just a machine. And this also discourages single run automation. So if you have something where you know how to set up a machine and you know how to configure a machine and you just say, oh, I'm just going to let that keep going, that behavior does not build resilient infrastructure. The more times you can reset and reprovision machines, the more likely you are to be able to recover quickly if something bad happens. And so it really is about building resilient, safe, fast, portable data centers to be able to implement these techniques. Do it. Learn the next technology. Get used to doing image-based deployments. And that enables you to get to probably the most critical of all these, which is building an infrastructure pipeline. And I just love this graphic, so had to use it again. Uh, the idea here is that infrastructure pipelines are the key to infrastructure as code they enforce all the other behaviors. So if you're driving towards building a pipeline, then everything we've talked about will come as part of supporting that pipeline. That means you're mixing provisioning and configuration. You're, you're doing them in tandem. That should be a standard process. That doesn't mean using the same tool for provisioning and configuration. What it means is doing provisioning and configuration and moving back and forth. These are not layered like a layer cake where you can do all your provisioning and then all your configuration and then you're done. They are much more effective if they are mixed. If you can do some 
configure some provisioning, then do some configuration, pull data back, influence your provisioning more to then move forward in setting other systems up and then do additional configuration. This is a loop. It's not a linear progression where you can do all of one thing and then all of the next and then all of the next. These infrastructure pipelines create cycles because you're continually resetting systems. And you need to think of them as coordinating operations across systems. So every system should participate in the process. That doesn't mean on day one, build up to it, but your goal should be that every system that has to be touched is touched automatically as part of a CICD pipeline. And that CICD pipeline thinking needs to translate into infrastructure, into your infrastructure pipeline. Not just CD deploy my software, but C infrastructure automation deployment provision, however you want to see it, uh, but build your infrastructure. Um, and be aware that pipelines change state throughout their life. So there is no way to build a pipeline where you think you know everything at the beginning of that pipeline and it just runs. Um, you actually need to build your pipeline so that they accumulate information as they go and then pass that down through the pipeline. Um, that's something that we learned uh, really critically as we were building Digital Rebar we found out that the less we assumed upfront knowledge and the more we assumed discovered knowledge, the more powerful and resilient our systems were. And the easier it was to create small modules because those modules needed, had the information they needed, they passed on the information that they created, and they became reusable because of that assumption. So how do we take all of this to the next level? If you're pretty good at some of the things I talked about, then let's talk about making it better. Or if you're just getting started, having a vision of the future is critical to building the systems well. These are the things that we encounter after customers have mastered the basics of infrastructure as code and they start scaling things up. What they get better at doing is handling variation and dealing with change over time. A lot of times the first infrastructure as code implementation is just to get things set up. It's basically a day one operation, but Infrastructure as code can create a powerful way to deal with changes over time. Patching your software, getting updates, new operating system rollouts. These are normal. And infrastructure as code makes them much more manageable. And that is something that you need to think about as you build. How do I handle this variation over time? How do I make it something that's resilient where I can patch and move that patch through my system down to the firmware level or new operating systems? All important things in how you scale up infrastructure as code. But we also need to be able to scale it out to think about using distributed infrastructure um, and having sites that have coherent automation across all of those sites. And this is where infrastructure as code is an amazing, powerful win. Because if you can get one site fully described with infrastructure as code, then you can replicate that success to all of your infrastructure. You can deal with changes over time and you can patch it. Everybody I know has multiple infrastructures, whether multiple clouds, multiple cloud sites, edge, their own data centers, colos, uh, sites where they have to actually have people working, crazy as that sounds nowadays. But the more that we have those automated in a consistent, repeatable way that deals with heterogeneity, the easier it is for us to create a distributed infrastructure pattern and have consistent systems, consistent automation throughout that. And that works because we invest in automation portability. So scaling up, scaling out, all work better the more and more portable and modular your automation has been. This is a key for development reuse, and I haven't talked about developers a lot, but one of the key things that developers do is they have modules. They bring in code that works from the other people using the tooling that they have right? Node, Java, Python, right? You can install modules that do useful things. That is the way infrastructure as code should work because it's development philosophy. And we need to have the same thing from an operations perspective where you can count on reusability and that if you've used a module, it'll be sustained for the long term and improve over time because other people are using it, which means that your code will improve even if you don't have to make any changes when you're using a standard model. So I've been talking at you pretty quickly because I wanted to have time for our demo. We've been collaborating with our enterprise customers to build universal workflow. And that means out of the box, it does all of the process steps that we see customers using in a normal case, that infrastructure pipeline. We don't turn everything on by default, but that means that you can grow into it. 
So if you've been using a universal workflow, then your system does all of the things that you would like it to do, even if you're not ready for that step, or you don't know what the conformance checks are, you don't need to shred the drives or burn in the systems or set the BIOS yet. You can skip that, but it's there. So it's easy to turn on when you're ready. And this is exactly what infrastructure as code thinking is about. Standard process, reusable modules, and extensible points where you can go in. So let me show you how our universal workflow works as inspiration for building your own automation pipelines. So it's demo time. This is a installation of digital rebar with three virtual machines running. And we're going to use our universal workflow to guide through that process. I've already done it once, and I wanna click on this and show you what it looks like to have run through the universal workflow. The idea here is to give you a sense of how you can build an infrastructure pipeline and what you might include in your infrastructure pipeline. All of this should reinforce everything we've talked about so far. So you'll notice here when I started the process, I was in a discovery environment, what we call Sledgehammer, and I went through a long list of activities to prep the install, make sure I had things right, and get, get the systems going. That can include RAID and BIOS configurations, it can include uh, just verification that everything's right. It can include scrubbing the disks and, and preparing the system. And then I can start, based on a profile, the install that I want to have running. Once that install completes, it's going to go through and build all of the additional steps. And you see it doesn't end there. It actually keeps going with additional classification, verification, and what we call chaining workflow components, meaning that this could then run additional profiles additional actions to install an application for you. At every point, there's options to add and remove additional workflow tasks into the process. So let me show you what it looks like to get there. I have two additional machines set up that I'm ready to run through the process. One of them, I'm going to assign an Ubuntu uh, system, so universal application Ubuntu, and I will use 20.04.02. It's one of the systems I have staged. And then for the other one, I want to run a CentOS install. So for that install, I'm going to find a universal CentOS. And in this case, I'll pick the 8.3 install here. Whoops, not on that machine. I want to attach it to this machine. And the point of this demo is that I want to start the same workflow on both. They have different profiles, one that contains the Ubuntu components, one that contains the CentOS components. But in either case, I'm going to start them with a universal discover process. That would be as if I had already um, wanted to run the machines through the entire discovery inventory checking and validation processes to start with. And as soon as I start that process, we are going to begin doing the install process, the install. So I have both of those systems running here. I'm going to force them to stay on the top of my desktop so that you can watch them in the background as we begin this process. So I say go here, and immediately the install begins on both of these systems. If I click in here, you can watch live as that work is being done, and we begin doing additional work in the system. And that is literally going to go through and run the entire infrastructure pipeline I need to make all this stuff work. Now, this is going to take a couple of minutes. And the simple way to do this is to provide you with the uh, time lapse to actually watch the installation go completely through the run. And I'm going to go back and let the machines come over here so that you can observe how things are going to work and go. So the system's just finished the install. And one of the things that's really important here is not just that you got to watch a system go through multiple reboot cycles to install operating systems with the exact same workflow pipeline and only different inputs. It's also notable that when things finished, we knew. We actually have an event stream that we can attach to. I can go look at a job log and see everything that happened and I can monitor that. If something goes wrong, I can see what happened. I can look at those logs 
and get a sense of what I need to fix. That is the essence of how to build these infrastructure as code pipelines. Everything in this automation is committed in Git. It's actually standard modules that I didn't touch in any way. I literally picked a profile, uploaded an ISO, and let machines install. No additional work was required. Now that doesn't mean that this is a perfect process. It's designed to have additions, extensions, and changes. And as we improve it over time, we will publish that back into our catalog and everybody in our, in our ecosystem will get the benefit of that work. That's the value of infrastructure as code. And implementing this in your own environment, Digital Rebar, whatever platform you choose, the goals of building a standard process that's modular and reusable is an important component of infrastructure as code. I hope this demo helped illustrate just how powerful a connected infrastructure pipeline can become. I hope that demo was interesting and informative. Um, we work really hard on trying to implement infrastructure as code the way I've been describing it, and we want to help other people do the same and, and show how we've learned what we're doing. So let's review what we've talked about in this infrastructure as code space and how you can advance infrastructure as code in your own organization. First, look at ways of adding infrastructure to the CI-CD pipelines that you already have. Those are good pipelines. They might not be thinking in infrastructure terms and they might have not, not be using the exact language for infrastructure, but they're a good starting point to connect to other systems. Figure out what you can safely put in source control. Eventually, everything is the right answer, but don't start there. Start with what can be done in a reasonable way, but do that and use it from source control. Get review processes and pull requests and things like that so that other people are watching what the code is and how it's working. Look about how you can improve control in your systems and avoid customization at the same time. If you're writing stuff that's unique to you, then you are not advancing as quickly down the infrastructure as code path. So you want to look at that and, and figure out how to reuse and modularize your systems. Think about how that you store your system state. This might be as simple as an audit where you can say, oh, I'm storing state in these six places, or I'm storing state in six places, and three of them have no idea that their state is stored anywhere else. And try to find ways to break down those islands, which might involve tool chains, tool changes. It might also involve just writing some more integration and sharing data better through this pipeline. But those silos will break your pipelines or be fragile points in your pipelines, and you need to be able to address it and be aware of it. And then most importantly, legacy isn't bad. Legacy is working software. Get over that it's, it's there. And instead of trying to burn that down, which I hear people do, figure out how to improve it. Figure out the small steps that you can isolate or reuse or take advantage of it. Uh, we have a lot of working systems in our data centers and in our infrastructure, a lot of hardware that's, that's still productive. We have a lot of software and automation tools that are still productive. And you want to be working in ways that take advantage of things that work because those things that have worked are battle tested. In a lot of cases have learned lessons that are in the code and you want to be able to recover. Thank you for taking some time to listen to my talk about infrastructure as code on bare metal. Um, we are sponsors of Lisa 2021 and we are huge fans of the work that Usenix is doing to support operations and operators in these environments. And it's fundamentally important, which is why we sponsored um, as part of that, we would love to talk to you, hear what you're doing, hear your battle stories, hear what you think we could do better, how this talk could be expanded, or what you're doing to be successful with infrastructure as code. Come by our booth. Um, as always, you can visit us at rackn.com. And if you want to talk to me personally, I am Zeical in almost every location, Twitter especially. And I'm happy to hear what you thought and how we could do better, because this is something where the industry needs to learn together.